So up next, we have FCC Commissioner Brendan Carr. So the commissioner has been a longtime friend of the deployment companies in our membership. He has been called the 5G crusader. He also has been really focused on making sure that you all have the skilled workforce that you need in order to deploy all these networks. We really appreciate him taking the time to be with us today. He comes to the Encompass Policy Summit every year. So it's great to have him again. And then one last thing, we do have something in common. We are both grads of Catholic University of America's Columbus School of Law. There are a number of us here in the room. Uh, the Catholic Mafia is what we like to call ourselves. So just really proud to have a fellow alum as an FCC commissioner and doing such a great job working on all these barriers to help us lower them. So thank you, Commissioner. I think it's Chip going to have a conversation with you. Thanks, thanks. Well, Commissioner Carr, thank you for joining yeah, us again. Yeah, thanks so much. I was glad to catch the uh, the end of Senator Lujan's uh, remarks. He's such a great leader on this. We did an op-ed together on uh, ACP, actually, and uh, he's just getting so much great policy done from leading on infrastructure to uh, affordability. So it was great to, to catch the tail end of his remarks. Well, it, it is a, a great example. Y'all's op-ed, it's just another example of usually where we can find bipartisan consensus and get good things done for the yeah. country. And we um, appreciate your leadership on on that program. We'll talk about that a little bit, uh, but really, well, gotta, you, before we start, I got to say, sure. you know, I'm looking at this photo when I started at the FCC. It's a little disconcerting <laughs> uh, to see, but you know, believe it or not, somehow I managed to have less hair now than I did back then, uh, and now I went with this white beard. And thank me, regret that decision when I look uh, when I look over there. But you know, it I, happens. I hear that 5G makes your hair fall out. <laughs> so may, maybe it's all those towers. You that's fall, right. You know? That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is what happened to me. <laughs> yeah. But uh, well, you, you're known as the the crusader, the champion for 5G, and, and but also on the on the deployment agenda on streamlining and, for example, on the small cell. Uh, many of the principles that we want to bring uh, as the broadband funding goes out the door and to the states and to the localities and deployed across the country. You know, we're very concerned as an association and our member companies who are deploying the advanced networks of the future. Um, if you send the money, but then you have the barriers that block it, that delay it, that increase the cost of it, that delay the capital, then we're really undermining many of the object the bipartisan objectives. So talk a little bit about your view on streamlining and what we can do both at the FCC do you need more authority? Can we help on, on the Hill? <laughs> what, what can we do to really advance the streamlining uh, and the deployments of all of our networks? Yeah, well, thanks. Well, I, I definitely think we have the playbook, as, as you noted, yeah. you know, streamlining infrastructure, something that we've always done when we're seeing a generational upgrade in technology. We did it when we went 3G to 4G. Uh, obviously, as you noted, we did it in 2017, 2018. We were moving from 4G to 5G, and it really had this massive acceleration uh, in the small cells, which were sort of the building blocks of 5G at the time. But you're right, there's a lot more that we need to do. Uh, Senator Lujan mentioned uh, Senator Barrasso. I did an event with him uh, up in his state in uh, Casper, Wyoming. Yeah. I visited with a provider. <clears throat> we went to their lay down yard behind their facility, and they had something like 70 miles of conduit sitting in their lay down yard, 90 antennas. Uh, the hard part, right, purchasing all that, getting it there, getting the crews ready, but yet they couldn't actually go and build it and deploy it because they didn't have the permits there was a lot of federal lands issues. And so we've, we've spent a lot of money, um, which is a good thing in terms of our goal of bridging the digital divide, but we're not pairing it sufficiently with streamlining on the permitting side, um, the actual infrastructure build side. And for me, I talk about that, that's like jumping on the gas and the brakes at the same time. Yeah. Senator Lujan mentioned he's been a strong leader, particularly on federal lands issues for how we can get going faster, um, and a lot of those ideas that I led on for small cells, I think is the right place to go. We just need to import that now into more wired infrastructure. So shot clocks on state, local, federal approvals, uh, cost-based fees. So people understand that the economic benefit for your community comes when we have the technology deployed, not you know <laughs> charging exorbitant fees to get it deployed. So we have that playbook. Um, I just think we have to get going a little faster as bead money, other money starts to hit the ground that we don't get slowed down and caught up in red tape. Well, as a, 
as our group goes to the Hill, we hope that there will be a bipartisan permitting reform bill that, that starts in the House early in the Congress. As we look at the Farm Bill, how do we uh, use the Forest Service um, as how, how do we have streamlining applied to the Forest Service? Yeah. Um, they grow trees really well, <laughs> but trees grow slow and sometimes yeah, their yeah. permits are slower. Well, I mean, you so, know, these, these are all really, you know, well-intentioned people, but they just have different missions, different yeah. reward structures. And, you know, moving very quickly on broadband infrastructure permits isn't something that uh, they're sort of paid to do yeah. per se. So we got to get better. But also, you know, you step back, you look at not just permitting issues, but, but funding. We've got funding now spread across lots and lots of agencies. It's not necessarily new as a dynamic, but I think it has accelerated with COVID as more funding came in to more agencies. There was a GAO report that I think said we have now 15 agencies with broadband funding, 133 different programs. And I am worried that we're starting to build sort of a, a broadband tower of Babel where we're not fully coordinated. We're not all using the same standards, build out metrics, speeds, technologies, overbuilding risks. And so I do think we need to be very, very careful here uh, and frankly, increase the level of coordination across these programs. Frankly, I would like to see a winnowing down and a consolidation of some of these programs. I just think we have broadband funds uh, dispersed across too many different places right now. And there's a lot of risk, I think, that comes from that. Anything that we can do to help on the coordination? Uh, you know, one of the initiatives is how do we get the maps to reflect all these different funding programs? Yeah. Probably up to $100 billion over COVID to infrastructure. Um, any thoughts on the on the mapping of where the, all these different programs are deploying networks? Yeah, I do think continuing to improve the maps is going to be vital. I think that's step one. My understanding is sometime this month there may be another version of the map. I'm not giving away any inside information. That's just my my sense from public reporting is that we may see another version of it. And it's very important that that second version uh, mark really significant improvement over the first version of the map. And so we got to get the maps right. But then I think we've got to make sure that all the funding decisions that flow from B dollars from other dollars use and go through that map. Because if we use the map and say, okay, we're going to use that for allocating B dollars, but you can use any metric you want as to where to build. Then I think, again, we get in that massive quandary of uh, potential overbuilding, waste, inefficient. Because the reality is I, I view the B program as really a, a pivot point. If we get it right, we can actually effectively end the digital divide in the country. Uh, if we get it wrong, it's a missed opportunity that I don't know that we're going to see again. We saw a relatively big influx of funding, 2008, 2009. It was, I don't know, seven or eight billion. We didn't quite get that one exactly right. Uh, and so it's, it's a long period of time between that level of extra infusion on top of USF. And we really got to get the policy right here. And at the end of the day, I think that's allowing for a mix of technologies. That's what Congress envisioned. I think the lion's share of the connections that we should support with BEAD are going to be fiber, just because I think it makes sense. But we have to leave room around the edges for fixed wireless and other technologies for two reasons. One, it is a matter of money. At the end of the day, even though we have billions and billions of dollars, it's not clear that it can get stretched everywhere if fiber is 100% of the connections. But if we have a, you know some single digit percentage of fixed wireless in there, then I think we can really get the job done. And it's also a time value issue that if we can use fixed wireless, again, we're talking mainly edge cases, corner cases here, where we can bridge communities across the digital divide in a matter of weeks as opposed to you know years and years. So that's important. As I've traveled around the country, I've tried to meet with a lot of uh, state broadband offices and offer my two cents you, along the lines I've been talking about here. So I've met with uh, just a week or so ago, the Kentucky uh, State Broadband Office. I've met with the Utah Broadband Office, Tennessee, Louisiana, and, and just trying to make sure that you know they're hearing different perspectives as they move forward. Oh, um... You're known for going out uh, into the field and up the tower and now to the offices. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go back a little bit though to an FCC issue that's pending, that's part of the uh, deployment agenda that we see and that's poll attachments. And any, any updates on the proceeding? Any thoughts of how that is going to, to possibly reach a conclusion here in the, in the near future? I do think we need to be providing more clarity on poll attachment. At the end of the day, you know, this is hard work. It's difficult work. We don't need these disputes uh, over rates and access to be slowing things down. I think the dispute resolution process itself 
uh, could be you know streamlined and made more efficient. And uh, you know, look, I was just in uh, small town Somerset, uh, Kentucky, and I visited a uh, a lineman training center of, that actually teaches the people how to climb poles. And I've done my fair share of climbing actual towers with you know ladders. I've getting rides in bucket trucks, which is easier than actually climbing. But this is the first time they actually got to strap on those uh, those little lake. I don't know what you call them, leg harnesses, leg pieces. Yeah. Someone, someone knows. <laughs> the uh, with the spikes, exactly, yeah. to climb uh, the traditional wooden utility pole. And, uh, and that, was, that was embarrassing. That was quite something. So I usually take a picture and tweet it out. But that one looked so awful that even I could not uh, bring myself to tweet a picture of me attempting to climb a wooden pole. So we got to get that process um, resolved in a way that provides more clarity because we can't have the pole attachment rates be the thing that uh, slows down our work to end the digital divide. Uh, we, we look forward to continuing to, to work with you on, on the pole attachment and on streamlining. One other uh, area where we've been working with you, and we appreciate you know, your support of starting the 12-2 the to 12-7 uh, proceeding. Uh, well, I think every, the, the chair gets credit for that. Yes. I, I'm just along for the ride on, the, on when proceedings are started. Yes. This, uh, actually, I, I, I saw uh, Chairman Pai uh, Ajib, at a at a conference not long ago, he said y'all are watching the Super Bowl together. Or, or <laughs> yes, the, yeah, yeah. the playoffs together. Right, right. And um, well, look, you know, Chiefs, I welcome I, I welcome any you know, again. yeah, anyone on the bandwagon of the Chiefs fandom, like a Jeep, uh, unlike me, you know, a long time uh, Chiefs fan. But it's okay, we welcome you know everybody. That's fine. Yes, yeah. Yeah. But uh, we were talking about twelve, and as as the the record is hopefully getting uh, near complete as you start the NOI on the 12-7 to 13-2. Yeah. Any thoughts on, on mid-band spectrum and on the pipeline and the, uh, the congressional authorization as, as you look forward uh, to what the FCC needs to move forward on all those proceedings to keep our leadership on, on 5G and then all the applications that, that, that flow over yeah. the network? Well, you mentioned uh, Chairman Pai, and I, I think really he uh, he just killed it when it came to uh, mid-band spectrum, but killed it in a good way. Uh, I, I remember when I started as general counsel in 2017 for him, the very first thing he had me do was take a look at an NOI to do a broad inquiry into mid-band spectrum, everything from you know just above 2.5 all the way up to you know 20 plus gigahertz. I remember you know starting out those conversations in you know February of 2017. Uh, with our counterparts at, 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 at DOD, and it was just even at NOI, in their view, was sort of a non-starter. And I can't tell you the amount of political capital that he had to uh, accumulate, that he had, and that he spent uh, delivering results on, on mid-band. It was, you know, one of the, I think, most important things that he did. And, and we moved forward on a, a lot of bands. I mean, obviously, we did, you know, 3.5. We did uh, the CBRS band. We did uh, C-band, the big kahuna. Uh, 5.9, 1200 megahertz and six gigahertz. You know, we just did mid band after mid band after mid band. And I do think we have to continue to get back to freeing up mid band on that same pace and cadence that Ajit was hitting. It's, it's difficult. It's always been difficult. It takes a lot of expenditure of political capital right now, but we need to continue to get that pipeline uh, filled with the mid band spectrum. I've put out uh, some ideas on spectrum bands we should be targeting. Obviously, lower three is sort of the, the big focus right now. Um, but we also have to make sure that we continue to have our spectrum auction authority, <laughs> which even that basic level uh, of authority seems to be uh, not lapsing, thankfully, uh, but a challenge to get that done, too. As, as we look at, you know, we've talked about fiber and fixed deployments, we're talking about 5G and, and, the, and the spectrum uh, pipeline and authorization. Um, one other area uh, where and Encompass really does meet its name and its definition. We encompass all the different network <laughs> deployments. We have fiber, we have fixed, we have right. uh, wireless, and we have uh, low earth orbit satellite. Uh, yeah. Amazon, one of our member companies with Kuiper. Is, is there any other authority that the FCC needs or uh, what do you see in the importance on the LEO systems, low earth orbit, uh, as far as broadband connectivity, especially in remote areas? And, and just the competitiveness uh, that we have that can come through all of these different new technologies and deployments. Yeah, I'm, I'm very optimistic about the, the all of the LEO systems that are up there, that are going up there in terms of their ability to compete, to offer uh, affordable high-speed broadband in some of the most remote parts uh, of the country and of, of the world. So I'm very optimistic there. Uh, obviously, you know, orbital debris continues to be a challenge. We want to make sure that, that we're in the right spot uh, on that front. but 
generally means sort of staying up there in space. The sort of emerging area of space mobile is something that's really interesting. I was just in Mobile World Congress Barcelona, and that was probably one of the top two or three hot topics over there was space mobile. We're looking at that at the FCC, how we can facilitate that. We'll take a vote on that soon. So I'm interested there. I don't know if it's going to be, you know, go totally gangbusters the way some people thought at Mobile World Congress, but I think it's interesting that we as a regular need to make sure it has the opportunity uh, to take off in the market if the market decides that it should. And and all of the, the streamlining, all the funding, all of these different deployments uh, are great. But if we don't have the, the, the people to climb the, the poles and who can actually put spikes on and, and yeah. climb the, uh, the, the poles or to be the fiber technician or the cloud technician, you've been a, a leader on workforce development. Any ideas that, that you think that would give us uh, not only uh, addressing the, the supply chain we need and material, but the workforce uh, uh, supply that we need to meet the moment, to meet the deployment challenges of, yeah. the, of the country. You know, we do have to obviously expand the workforce tremendously. The last two or three years as I've, I've traveled, I try to, it's sort of a ones and twos process, but I've gone around and visited community colleges that have tower training and sort of fiber splice programs. I've worked with ones to stand them up, everything from Aiken, South Carolina, uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, a couple in Sioux Falls was just, again, as I mentioned in Somerset, Kentucky visiting with one of their programs. We try to travel around a lot um, and encourage people to stand these programs up, including uh, in sort of Mississippi Gulf Coast Community College. Uh, they've been standing up a program as well. And so we got to continue to do that because again, as all this money finally actually hits, there's gonna be a massive rush to have the, the crews in place to do these builds across the country. I think the bigger companies are gonna have be okay. They're gonna either have the the payment structure, they're gonna have the long-term contracts to lock up these crews. But I do think for smaller, mid-sized providers, for builders, it's gonna be a challenge to, to make sure we have that workforce in place to have those, when those B dollars hit. So I think we gotta to continue to leverage community colleges. Again, it's an eight to 12 week program and you can learn the mix of classroom and whether it's physical climbing or splicing skills to land a good paying job in this industry. Well, we, we wanna work with you on this issue because it is critical uh, to our member companies. Um, one other area where, where you've uh, had the courage to, to lead is confronting China where ne necessary, containing you know, from rip and replace to TikTok. Uh, any thoughts on, on what both Congress and the FCC can do to meet the moment, not only that we, we continue to win the race on 5G, but what are the security elements that we need to be careful and cautious about that we need to confront, that we need to contain? Yeah. Well, Chip, I, I've been very hesitant to, to speak publicly on TikTok. If you really push me in this, in this direction, uh, I'll do it. You know, the way I think about it is, you know, at the FCC, we have developed over the last three or four years in particular, a real expertise when it comes to entities um, that have ties back into communist China and involve sort of malign or nefarious or, or secret data flows. And we started, as you noted, at the, what I call the device layer. So Huawei, ZTE uh, took strong action there. In fact, now have developed a really good sort of global perspective on the risks that come with Huawei and ZTE. We then sort of moved up a little bit in the layer to look at carriers. So we looked at China Mobile, China Unicom, um, other entities that have Section 214 authorizations, and we have revoked a lot of those, in fact, uh, Chairwoman Rosenworcel deserves a lot of credit for really following through and getting a lot of that done. And I thought that next layer that we need to look at is the application layer. I think, um, as I've uh, spoken about, um, I think TikTok really poses a very unique set of national security threats. But also, I think what we're seeing is a very unique set of mental health issues as well, particularly for, for young people. Now, I should say, whenever I talk about this, people seem to omit this from my, from my remarks. I, there's a baseline level of concern that I have with all social media in terms of access to data and in terms of potential mental health challenges. But I think there is something sort of unique about TikTok that stands out above and beyond all of that. And there's some interesting work on privacy being done in Congress um, that would put some good baseline protections in place. But I still think there's something unique about the threat from TikTok that we need to deal with. And, and at this point, it's certainly not not me, I'm far from alone in doing that. Senator Mark Warner has been very vocal on this. Mm -hmm. um, a tremendous number of national security officials in the Biden administration have spoken about it from ODI uh, Haynes to CIA Director Burns, uh, FBI Director Chris Wray. And again, we're seeing increasing concerns globally as well. European Parliament, European Commission, the last couple of weeks have taken action as well. So 
TikTok has been the subject of a two-year-long CFIUS review at this point. There was a rumor at the end of uh, August or so last summer that they were close to cutting a preliminary deal. But based on my reading, it looks like that deal is no longer close to being put in place. And at this point, we just have to really bring that CFIUS proceeding to a close. I think the Biden administration at this point both has their own national security officials sounding the alarm, and the Biden administration has every tool necessary to take concrete action. And so I think we've studied this for a while. We've looked at it for a while. Um, and it's time for us to take action. I think there's some you know, interesting arguments being made now in defense of TikTok that to me sort of show that we've reached the sort of the, the kitchen sink phase of, of, of discourse over TikTok. There's an argument, for instance, that we can't prohibit TikTok consistent with the First Amendment because people use TikTok for expressive activity. But, but you know, to me, that's like the equivalent of arguing that the government can't shut down a restaurant for repeated health code violations because people like to talk uh, while they eat. And so I don't think it's a very strong argument at the end of the day. We have the tools we need to do this. And I think we just have to show that we have the ability to not just talk about a threat like this, but to take action. Again, I think it's just a natural evolution from Huawei ZTE, China Mobile. We need to get one at least um, on the application side. That's that's a real threat. Would, would divestiture be a good remedy, an effective remedy? Do you think? Yeah, I think I, to me, it's either way. It's, it's either, you know, you could be in the app um, or you could go with an approach that's a complete divestiture, a complete breaking of the corporate links back to any entity that is itself beholden to communist China. And either one of those are, are acceptable to me at this point. Um, but we have to sort of get going with taking action. We just, we've been talking about it. We've been building consensus, which is really good. Um, that's sort of the, the first step in addressing any problem is admitting you have the problem. But now we've got to go to the second step, which is to, to take some real action. Well, as, as we close our, our conversation today and then continue our work going forward, and as we go to the Hill tomorrow and go to the FCC and go uh, to have conversations with NTIA tonight and, and over the, the course of the, of the ASIA implementation, any, any advice that you give uh, to our member companies and, and what can we do to best assist uh, the FCC in having the information to make the best uh, decisions as we try to to meet the moment historically yeah. of yeah. What, what you described in, in all of your comments. This is a rare opportunity that we can connect every American. Yeah, sure. We can meet the challenge of competing against China for both the most advanced networks and applications. And we can do it in a way that makes sense uh, from a security and a privacy point of view. So any, any advice uh, to the Encompass members and, and to, the, to the community here today? Yeah, I think you guys do a great job. They do a great advocacy on this. I think, again, the most important thing is to make sure that we stay coordinated. I think using the FCC map, not just for allocation, but for actual uh, decisions about where to build, I think that's going to be very vital, avoiding overbuilding. We have to obviously continue to focus, um, I think, as the statute requires, on those places that are completely unserved today. We obviously wanna get people the best, most robust services, but let's prioritize the places that have you know, zero over zero um, over other communities at the moment. I think that's gonna be real real vital going forward, so. We appreciate uh, all your service. And, uh, and I, I did notice a couple of times that you've been to Kentucky um, that is, and, and to Mississippi. That's right. And, and South this, Dakota. I don't know, in these jobs, you end up in, uh, <laughs> historically, Mississippi and South Dakota an awful lot. Now I'll probably have a lot more trips to Texas. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting how the Senate Commerce Committee has always been dominated by, by small states. <laughs> so, so we uh, we look forward to, it, to to working with you going forward and yeah. appreciate all the, the work that we've been able to do with you in the past. And uh, thank you for, for what you do at the commission and for the country. Yeah, thanks, Rick. See you again. Thanks.